Hey guys, welcome back. Here's another video for you. It's going to be a little bit of an elaboration on the explanation I gave to Saki in the comment section below regarding the S300 SXR cutback on the turbine wheel. Uh, Saki, this one's for you. Hey guys, uh, welcome back. Here's a short video for you uh, after I gave an explanation to my guys to post in the comment section. Uh, in response to Saki's comment or question regarding the cutback on the turbine blade and uh, he wasn't really able to understand that. I know it is a technical comment and it is quite technical and you start delving into the metallurgical side of things. Unfortunately, uh, that's how my brain works. So I'll try and put that into layman's terms here for you, Saki. I hope this helps. All right, let's get into it. So first of all, you get two different types of turbine blades, one with and one without a cutback. Um, sure, you get lots of different designs, different number of blades, etc. But uh, typically, your um, main blade where you have the same number of uh, same height blades, you will find that uh, you either have a cutback or you don't. Now, uh, on your screen now, you'll actually see two blades, one on the left that has got no cutback and one on the right that has got a cutback. And pretty much what you're looking at is the orientation of the top of the extrusor blades in relation to one another, in relation to the horizon, the horizon. So if you hold these up like a lollipop, the top of the blades where the gases exit out of the uh, downpipe and exhaust system will typically be horizontal with the horizon. And with the uh, cutback blade, you'll see that angle downwards. Now, what is the reason for that? Angling those blades downwards will basically cut off the ends or the tips of those blades, in essence, shortening them and lowering the, the rim speed of those outer blades. Now, those blades, while operating in a turbine housing, are running at high speed, high pressures, high temperatures, but also high frequency, believe it or not. Now, the frequency comes from the firing order and the pulses from the engine's exhaust that is entering the turbine housing. And let's take a four cylinder, for example, your firing order typically is one, three, four, two. Those are firing pulses coming into that turbine housing. And obviously the higher the engine revs, the higher the frequency becomes. So typically what you'd like to do is you would try and stay away from the fourth order that gets very technical. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I'll put a picture on the screen here for you, um, courtesy of uh, Honeywell. And uh, what you're looking at there is the pulses coming through the turbine housing into contact with the uh, turbine inducer blades. Now, every time you have contact with a, a pulse and a blade, you have what we term blade excitation. And there's a vibration that's induced in that blade. And that vibration is in essence uh, normal. It's normal, it's 100% it's supposed to be there in normal operating conditions. However, the faster the turbocharger is expected to rotate under normal circumstances, under normal design parameters, the higher the frequency and the more stresses and strains are applied on those blades. And typically you'll find that the outer blades, the corners of those outer blades, uh, you'll see on the screen now, just depicting a little red, a red section over there, is where you'd find the, the blade being exerted to the most stresses. And those stresses are cycles. That those vibrations are in essence bending moments, if you wish. And if you take a, a, a step back into when you guys are still kids, at least when we were still kids, I don't know what the age or the average age is of, uh, of the viewers on this channel, but we used to take a piece of wire and we used to bend it backwards and forwards, bend it backwards and forwards, and it would actually generate heat on the actual section where you're bending. And just before it breaks, it got so hot that we used to burn our mate or whatever the case is. But what happens is that's a cycle. And... It, it fatigues every time you bend that wire open and closed, open and closed, open and closed. You concentrating um, a fatigue on that specific point, and eventually, what happens is, it's it forms a surface crack on the actual surface of that wire, or in this case, the blade. And with every cycle bending moment or bending uh, uh, um, frequency that crack grows, even though it's microscopically, it does grow and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it 
cannot sustain itself. In other words, the, the material holding itself onto the main blade becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually that piece breaks off. Now, metallurgically speaking, as that crack grows, it propagates, spreads. But where does it spread? It's got to have a path, a route, uh, uh, um, a concentration point that it will actually follow. And that is known as a grain boundary. Now, if you look at a piece of wood, you find that every piece of wood, I'm not talking about pressed wood, even though microscopically they do have a grain boundary, but like a, a normal natural piece of wood that you'd go and buy at a timber shop or whatever the case is, that has typically got a grain, it's got lines. And if you take an axe and you hit that piece of wood with an axe in line with a grain, you'd actually break that easily then, or much easier than in comparison when trying to cut across the grain. So what happens is, let's say you take a piece of wood, put it in a kiln, and you abnormally um, speed up the, the, the curing or drying process, and the wood tends to crack. If it cracks, and you grab that piece of wood where it cracked on the edge, and you bend it, and you start applying forces to it, along that crack, it will actually grow, propagate, spread along the grain boundary. It's not going to take a 90 degree turn and go across the grain because it, it, it's going to follow the path of least resistance. And there's more resistance in trying to bend and break the grain than as opposed to going along with the grain itself and actually following the path of least resistance. So when I start talking about grain boundaries, materials have got them, whether it's ferrous, non-ferrous, super alloys, it doesn't matter, brass, bronze, aluminium, steel, mild steel, stainless steel, it doesn't matter what it is, titanium, inconel, all of them have got grain boundaries. And as soon as you have a fracture, that fracture will follow the grain boundary. So that's the explanation, I hope that helped. But to answer your question, HCF or combating HCF by cutting the ends of those blades off actually shortens and lowers the rim speed of those tips and it also strengthens the blade because you don't have as much blade floating around in in the air or, or um, far away from the actual root which is this, the, the support structure for the blade. Um, so what you do is you actually cut those tips off and it strengthens the blade and it takes away that little edge that you'd normally find those stress concentration bending moments that cause those fractures in the surface. And that's what HCF and combating HCF with a cutback on a turbine blade is for. It does have other consequences and benefits, believe it or not. But that's for another video. Hope that helped. Uh, we're running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to cut the video short. Please uh, like, subscribe, comment down below. Catch you next time.